Welcome to the Song Revolution. Inspiring you to dive deeper into your songwriting and creativity. To reach the world with the message of Jesus. Here's your host, John Chisholm. Hey, everybody, welcome to the show this week. It's always so good to hang out with you for a little bit and to uh, hear from some great people that I know will encourage you and make your life better. In fact, our show is all about that. It's about more than songs, y'all. It's about a better life. Well, today I have a sweet friend of ours, Meredith Andrews, back with us. She was on the show a year or so ago, but you guys know so much has happened in the last 12 months that I wanted to have this dynamic, fiery little worship leader back on to preach a little and to share what God's been doing in her life. And believe me, it wasn't disappointing. You're going to be really pumped when you listen through today and realize that Meredith is still going strong and leading worship in a world on fire. You know, Meredith spent a long season leading worship at Harvest Bible Chapel in Chicago as part of the vertical worship team. She and her husband, Jacob Suter, have been in Nashville a bit, leading at the Belonging Co. Church and traveling globally until the 2020 pandemic just brought everything to a screeching halt. And Meredith shares about the dramatic shifts in their lives with their three children suddenly stuck at home, her adjustment to homeschooling, and how she's found some hidden blessings in it all. Above everything, Meredith is a woman of the word and gets pretty fired up in this interview. I know you'll be as encouraged as I was and find some fresh courage for your life too. But before we jump to the interview, I want to give a shout out to our sponsor, Nashville Christian Songwriters, a company dedicated to empowering Christian songwriters all over the world. And they do that through this podcast, through a growing community of dedicated Christian songwriters called NCS Membership. Great resources like their new video course called Your Best Songs Now that will give you a proven step-by-step -step process for your songwriting if you're a songwriter. Now, this course is only 97 bucks and contains over 15 videos, transcripts, and exercises to help you ramp up your songwriting all for under 100 bucks. And their powerful eight-week online coaching program is there if you're ready for a deep dive to take your songwriting higher than ever before. Get that from deep to high to reach a broader audience. It's all there for you at NashvilleChristianSongwriters.com. I hope you'll check it out today. So now, here's multiple Dove Award-winning worship leader and songwriter, mentor, preacher, and our sweet friend, Meredith Andrews. Meredith Welcome to the show. Thank you, John. So this, honored to be here. Uh, this is round two. We did one a year or so ago. Yep. I should have looked up the date. I was I was just Gaga fanboy. I, did, I, <laughs> I was so nervous. I, I don't know. I just That's loved so your funny. work. That's so funny. You didn't come across like you were nervous uh, at all. I, it. I just try to hide it and be yeah. professional. But You did a good I, job. Well, thank you. I was just yes. blown away. Uh, you know, my wife and I are just huge fans. I know that sounds so geeky, but no. your music has had such an incredible impact. And so, wow. I don't know, I was just a little nervous. <laughs> oh, well, that means a lot to me. Not, I don't, I, you know, there are days when I'm just like, I don't even know how, but praise God. Yeah. I'm well, honored. God has certainly used you and will continue to use you. You know, our show, we try to focus on things that are, you know, more than music, more than songs. Yeah. And um, my funny little thing is that it's about more than songs, y'all. It's about <laughs> a better life. So yeah. what's, what's making your life better now? Oh, man. In these crazy days that we're living in, right? Um, honestly, it's kind of like finding this new rhythm. Um, there's a, you know, the verse, and I think it's in Matthew when Jesus talks about um, how his yoke is easy and his burden mm. is light. I, I've just been like kind of leaning into that. And he talks a lot about, well, in, if you look at that verse in the Passion Translation, it says this phrase, um, unforced rhythms of grace. I love that. I do yes, too. Yes, that's a great phrase. And I'm just like, Lord, how do I walk in that space? Because I can get overwhelmed by life and laundry and kids sure, and all yeah. of it, you know, how does it all work together? But God, you've invited me into unforced rhythms of grace. So I want to step into that, mm. um, believing that if I lay my burdens at your feet, knowing that you care for me, n believing that I'm not meant to carry the weight of the world on my shoulders, but I can just release it and trust God, you know, and that he invites us into this space. And I'm still 
figuring out, you know, what that looks like. Yeah, right. But I think just knowing that there's an invitation to operate from unforced, unforced rhythms of grace, you know, this flow with the Lord where we're just not affected by circumstances. And I, I, that's me leaning into that is kind of uh, is bringing me life just in the sense of chasing it. Lord, what does it mean? Um, how do I grow in that area? Right. And, you know, like as a musician, as an artist, um, my life before all of this was a lot of travel and a lot of leading worship for churches and conferences and events. And, um, you know, now I'm homeschooling my kids and um, <laughs> writing songs when I can um, and all, you know, all that comes with those things. But it's been a really sweet season, and mm. I'm so thankful for what God has done um, in the last nine months in my own heart. It's been an adjustment, but it's been a refining. It's been yeah. kind of unearthing. And, mm. you know, I think for all of us, it's like whatever can and will be shaken has exactly, been, right? you know? And I've been hearing that a lot. Mm -hmm. I mean, I had Matt Maher on the show recently, and yeah. he was talking. I asked him the same question. Yep. What's making your life better? And he said, while I'm home, yeah. you know, and hadn't been home like that in 15 years. Exactly. And so discovering those unforced mm -hmm. rhythms when you've got kids that are, yep. you know, they're not in their routines. Right. You know, spouses aren't in their routines. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, when I was traveling all the time years ago, if, if I had a break, you know, my wife was like, don't you have someplace to go? <laughs> <laughs> right, <laughs> because sure. she had her own rhythms, her rhythm, right? Yeah, so, for sure. Yeah. So I, take us a little more into that because I love that unearthing of things that maybe God wanted to deal with. Yeah. Or what does that mean for you? Yeah. Well, I think for me... Um, Pressing pause on everything um, just allowed me and, and, and made me realize just how much I needed rest and how much I needed to understand that my identity, like, and I would have said this to you, John, like I could articulate it with the best of them, that what I do is not who I am. And yet when all of that doing stuff was taken from me, right. I literally didn't know what to do with myself. Mm. You know, it was like. How do I function? What is my role? What That's is my purpose? So insightful, yeah. And I think for me, like I'm very driven by purpose. Like I need to have something with deep meaning to feel like I'm contributing to the world and that my life matters. I need to have sure. purpose. And so God was challenging me and just saying like, you have to find purpose in and of th like this environment, this season, where it's not just this routine of, going on the road, leading worship, teaching, but it's actually what is the purpose that I've entrusted to you within your own home for an extended period of time, every day, day in, day out, mm -hmm. you know, when I feel like I'm more of a referee for my kids than a mom, yeah. <laughs> you know, it's like, where's the purpose Stop in that? that. Yes. Stop that now. <laughs> I mean, even today, like for instance, just a specific example, we're kind of coming off the heels of Thanksgiving and, you know, holidays and mm -hmm. all of that. And uh, we're getting back into this rhythm of, you know, homeschool. And uh, my kids were just like not, not having it, you know. And I had to literally just stop teaching. And we had to sit on our couch, which I've just renamed the Peace Couch because <laughs> it's where we <laughs> make peace with one another. Yeah. And you know, we had to, I had to have conversations with all three of my or kids I'm going to take a piece out of you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I haven't <laughs> threatened that yet, but we've gotten really close. But just going like, if my kids, I have to just zoom out and go, if all we learned today in homeschool was how to get along with one another, how to make peace with one another. It's valuable, yeah. It is valuable. How to mm. forgive. Like, mm. those are the things. Like, if I can teach my kids, this might be the only year that I homeschool, but if I can teach my kids how to be gracious to one another, to forgive, to resolve yeah. conflict in a healthy way, mm. then, man, I feel like homeschool is for the win, you know? Yeah. Like, we've we've accomplished something. Um and I have to get out of my own task-oriented mentality and go, what do I want my kids to take away from this year? Mm. I don't want them. Yes, I want them to grow in reading and math and all the, these subjects. And I want them to learn things in terms of academically. But more than that, I, it, it feels like a character development year. 
mm, um, ever wow. since March and not yeah, just right? for my kids, yeah. but it's got to start in, in me and exactly. in my husband. It's like the Lord is just putting his thumb on certain areas and going, yeah, that's a fracture. Let's address it. Let's heal it. Let's mm. wrap it in a cast. And that hurts. Don't use it for a while. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah. But the thing I'm learning is like, if you've got a fracture and you continue to use it, you continue to put weight on it. It's only going to increase yeah, the fracture. Right. So I think that just taking time to rest and address it and mm. heal it is so necessary in order to be able for it to actually be strong. Um, strengthen uh, yeah. further down the road because right? his purposes are to heal it yes. right and that's why he brings those things up that's exactly you right know, the woman at the well <laughs> yes. you know he called her out for who she was yeah. and her character yeah and but, but the it purpose, wasn't to shame her right. it was to exactly. heal her yeah. exactly yeah and so that's where we're living and have been you know and it's kind of been in waves and but i'm just so grateful because i'll look back on this time and go look what god did i'm not the same person as I was before, because I just feel like I've got this foundation under me. Not that I didn't have a foundation before, but I think that God will take us to deeper places Mm -hmm. when we're willing to surrender in deeper ways. When we're willing to just say, okay, God, I'm here for it. Whatever this looks like, it might be painful. So good. And and we don't always know the way. I was listening to uh, Jordan Peterson, the Canadian guy, and he was talking about how when our lives are disrupted, like they have been in 2020, it's like losing the map. Right. And it's like losing the way. And mm-hmm. he had a brilliant analogy. He said, it's like when you go to the dentist mm-hmm. and your mouth is all numbed up, mm-hmm. your tongue doesn't know the map of your mouth anymore. Sure. That, and so you struggle for a while right. until the numbness goes away. And I think we've been kind of numb yeah. in 2020. Yeah. Wow. That's really And that's good. a good analogy, isn't it? It is a great analogy. But even that word, like disruption, that's yes. what it's been. Yeah. It's, But I think... When like at first I just was like this is this is not cool <laughs> you know <laughs> I was like I I'm not I don't want to do this of you course. know um and we can choose to fight it which I think you know I don't when I say fight it I just mean how do we make the most of where we are and I and I don't mean like lay down and and take it and just go like well I'll wake me up and it's when it's over, but it's more just <laughs> numbing like numbing out yeah even how, more. Yeah, yeah exactly yeah. because I think this is an opportunity mm. it's like a holy disruption yes it's a holy interruption it's like this divine interruption for us to go wow I have this time and I've had this time you know I think people are getting back to um, somewhat more normal rhythms but in the beginning especially just going like what do I do with this time and now I'm home and with these people and Mm -hmm. what is it for but just the beauty of that actually I think of God just going yeah lean in like don't don't miss this you might never have a chance like this again yeah yeah I mean touring was totally shut down yeah for those of you who were used to being on the road right used to being out there uh leading worship and you know doing your thing and suddenly that is just ripped completely out yeah wow It's, it's, it's totally frightening so what are your hopes for 2021 are I other than getting back to uh, you know, to touring and, yeah. and, and leading worship. What do you feel you will carry into that? Mm. I think with all of, you know, I think, John, man, <laughs> just the way that 2020 has shaken down. And um, I know for me, it's been, it's been very eye-opening and uh, has just made me aware of what's happening around me even more like on a global scale, I don't want to be so, I guess, wrapped up in my own life that I miss what God is doing around the world, what God is doing. And it could be, I'm not just talking about like in India, but I'm just saying like, how do I zoom out and have a heavenly perspective and not just like charge ahead with my own agenda or my own dreams? Because I, I want to be so careful to go, God, all the things that you've placed in my heart, I believe that it's for the advancement of your kingdom. It's not for the advancement of my career or my ministry. This is for the advancement of the kingdom of heaven. So how do I partner with you in loving people? You know, like even just, I know my neighbors better now than I did before Mm. and getting to know what their needs are and Mm -hmm. inviting them into our home and, um, 
making meals for them. And, you know, these are things that we did wasn't really a part of our lives before, not because we didn't care, but because we didn't have time. Exactly. And now that it's like we've entered into this place of where we have more margin, it's like I don't want to let that go. Mm. So even in 2021, if things hopefully kind of find a, sure. a rhythm yeah. to that was, you know, a little bit closer to what we knew before. Um, I don't want to lose the beautiful things, the, the relationships, the, um, just taking time for what matters to have conversations where we just weren't so busy to so be good. busy, right? Yeah, right. But we actually saw people and loved them and were able to meet them where they were. And, um, that's what the gospel is anyways. Like mm-hmm. that's what, as the church, we're supposed to be doing anyways. And I think that this time has been such a shaking for us to go, Lord, what's really on your heart? Yeah. And I just don't want to miss that. And I don't mm-hmm. want to lose that at, at going into a new year. I'm hopeful for 2021. I'm kind of done with 2020, but it's like, <laughs> I, but in the same regard, I, I, I know there's so many takeaways from 2020 that I don't want to lose, that I want to carry with me, that will mm. influence and inform the way that I live my life, the way that I love people, the way that I stand up for what I believe in, but but in a way that is not ostracizing or, you know what I'm saying? It just invites people in and going, let's have a conversation about these things that feel so divisive. Mm. Let's sit down around a fire pit, around a table, you know, break bread together and talk about why I would love to know your perspective. Why do you see things this way? Here's my perspective. How do we have this conversation instead of just seeing a post on Instagram and going, oh, well, they don't think the way that I think and writing them off exactly. completely. Unfriending them. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Well, that's good. And I think there's going to be a rush. Maybe maybe it'll go both ways. Some people, introverts, probably have loved 2020. Right, sure. <laughs> <laughs> but the rest of us yeah. will probably a rush into relationships that could yeah. be good or bad. I don't know. Right. But uh, yeah, <laughs> well, that's it. good. So what are some of the dreams that are yet to be fulfilled for you? Because you've lived pretty amazing lives, some yeah. Dove Awards and lots of accolades for people that are, you know, in music and in worship and recording yeah. and all that would love to have. And you've, you've led worship in front of tens of thousands of people all around the world yeah. and you know some you know crazy famous people and you know you're you're kind of in that echelon of of worship leaders that, that is if we're gonna if we're gonna sin and, and be enviable I mean you, you've you've had a beautiful life sure all right up to this minute so totally. what what are some of those yeah. dreams that might be which be it's yet to, <laughs> to fulfill? realize yeah well I <laughs> it's funny even just to hear you say that because I feel I it almost feels like I'm having an out of body experience when you start talk, saying that to me because yeah. I feel like the same person who came out of this tiny little town in North Carolina, you know what I mean, with this tiny little church, and um, and I think that's one of the ways that the Lord just keeps me humble because everything that I have, He's given me. It's not something that I even really worked for. Mm. I mean, I've worked for it, but it's more that I've just tried to steward what He's placed in my hands already, and um. I think the goals and the dreams that I have in my heart have to do with um, with people, like the people that I want to reach. Um, spheres of influence, yes. Certain environments, yes. But I think more specifically, it's just people. Um, I I would love the chance for my music to be uh, just to still go further, and but not because I need more followers on my Instagram or um, listeners on my Spotify, more just because I believe that God has given me something to steward and to carry, and I want to do that well, and I want people to be impacted by it and pointed straight to Jesus Mm. because of it. Because when I write music, um, it's not, I I don't know, I, I, I really strive and long to write songs that, draw people into an encounter with God. And because I've realized from my own experience, when I've encountered God, that's been the thing that's marked me and changed me forever. And so for people to actually not just hear words or, um, you know, like read, read song lyrics or, or sermon or whatever, it'd be this head thing, but to actually, experience the very presence of God, which I believe that we were meant to do. We were created for. And 
you know, I think the things specifically on my heart to do so, um, I'm releasing a Spanish album early in 2021. Awesome. So Yay. it'll be 10 songs that are all, you know, songs that I've released before in English, but never, sure. but now I oh, have recorded perfect. them in Spanish. Yeah. And, um, and then how is that learning the, the Spanish translations? So Spanish was actually, I almost majored in Spanish in college. Okay. I almost moved right. to Guatemala to work in an okay. orphanage. Okay. So, so I'm not fluent, yeah. but I've always like, it's been come naturally to me somewhat. So I had um, Lucia Parker, who's a worship leader. She's from El Salvador, but she lives in, in Franklin. But she translated all the songs, and then she came into the studio and made sure I was singing everything there right, you, you know? Yeah. And she's amazing. Because you didn't sound stupid. So. Yeah, exactly. I'm like, <laughs> yes. And she would help me because there's sometimes when you're trying to f- fit all the words together, they blend. And so they r- like literally run into each other where they overlap and it's just different from English. So you right, have to, l- right. those were tricky, you know, Sure. but yeah. so fun. And, um, you know, I dream about getting to do like a Latin America tour, you know, yeah, and, um, absolutely. I've always had a heart for the Spanish speaking mm. people and just excited to see that door kind of open um with the release of this music and yeah. um is there a title yeah. for that album yet we're still working on it oh, <laughs> we're okay. still trying to figure out because we'll probably just take one of the songs which are you know open up the heavens not for a moment the songs from my last right. ep they're all translated so just trying to uh yeah nail down what encompasses the album so we haven't quite gotten that far but i'll let you know i'll yeah. keep you posted well when you were going to originally come to the home studio to do this today my wife said will she sing not for a moment for me oh <laughs> i would have <laughs> I mean, I bet she would have sung a line or two anyway yeah so, that's sweet Aww. so you've been doing the worship leading thing for a minute now yeah how would you say it's changed for you both the leading and maybe even in on the inside of your heart ha- uh, or has it changed yeah i think I think in some ways it has, in some ways it stayed the same. Because when I look back over, you know, where things kind of started for me, the first time I ever sang a song in church on stage was when I was six years old, and it was the song, I Love You, Lord, you know. And uh, I feel like God always brings me back to that. Lord, let it be a sweet, sweet sound in your ear, because that's all that matters. And, um, you know, growing up when I was in junior high and high school is when the Lord really just captured my heart captivated my heart with his presence where every day I would turn on like after school or maybe even sometimes before school if I get up early enough I'd turn on vineyard or um do you remember that do you remember that record with Catherine Scott on it that had the song hungry oh yeah yes like Mm -hmm. that album I lived on that forever and uh Rita Springer and Delirious and you know I would turn those albums on and I would just spend time in God's presence and he would meet me every time so that's where I learned to worship it wasn't Mm. even on a stage it was right in my room in the secret place in the secret place God just meeting me she brought something there was something so unique I don't know if it was just her accent or no I think it's just the anointing like at she the was, foot of the cross yes. so many incredible songs yes and I mean I know she's her and her husband are pastoring a church out in California in Orange County now and and she just released a record and still it's that sweet purity uh, you can just tell that she spends so much time in the presence of God and mm. those were the people because you could feel it just like translating through the CD player at the time you know wow. and it just drew me right in to the throne room. And I just had so many sweet times with the Lord in my room because of those people, you know, <laughs> that now that I've gotten to like know some of them, you know, of um, like Rita, we've written a song together and or a couple and, uh, and I just love her, you know, so like, good. she's so just, amazing. Yeah. I mean, if you know her work, yes. Rita Springer, just, yes. I don't know. She's never had like giant success right. like some people have, right? Sure. I mean, yeah, I guess in terms of like, you know, as you would categorize success in the music industry. Exactly, world. right. But she's such a deep well. She is. And she's yeah. like the mother of worship. Like, you know, but and That's also worshipers. Like yeah. she she has this thing on her life where she just I mean, she came to I had a writer's retreat in October and she came for a day and a half or so and basically just spoke a word over every person that was there. I was like, this is what I see over your life. This mm. is what God told me about you. And, I, and it's just like, I don't know anybody else who could do that. You know, she's just so in tune with the Holy Spirit. Yeah. 
And uh, I'm just so thankful for her because, you know, when I was a 14-year-old kid, I was getting wrecked just by listening to her music yeah, and being absolutely. like, God, this is the cry of my heart, mm. you know? And so in those ways, it stayed the same for me. But in other ways, I think it's also um, that I've had to protect that and that I've had to guard against uh, worship as a genre or worship as an industry, you know, because worship is worship. It's ascribing worth to God. And we can so easily just, and I do it all the time, interchange the word worship with a style of music right. when it's actually the posture of my heart. Or singing. Yeah. Yes. Mm-hmm. When it's actually just supposed to be my response to who God is, you know? So I think it's just been learning to grow in my worship and go deeper in my worship. And my worship is about what happens behind closed doors? What what am I singing to the Lord? What does my life look like to, before the Lord? It, it, living to please Him, you know? And that is that is worship. And if that's the foundation, then everything that comes out of that is just like extra, you know? Yeah, right. Yeah. I think you're right, though, that we've for so long just made worship and singing and the genre right you know synonymous yeah and it's hard to tell them apart sometimes Can so be. yeah and there's so many great people we could spend the rest of the podcast talking about people like jenny lee riddle yeah you know people that yeah. are have have really sewn into upcoming generations 100%. in such a deep yep. way and yes. uh, so so yeah. what do you do? Do you see any of that for yourself in yeah. the future? And yeah, and I've actually been doing. Um, it's funny. You never know when things are going to shift from you being the like Timothy to being the Paul to being the Barnabas. You know what I mean? And I think you you're always in all three of those roles at any given point to someone. But uh, I don't know. I think in the last five years, especially, um, it's kind of shifted for me into this more of a big sister or a, or a kind of a mother role. And when I say that, I mean like I, I love to nurture people and encourage people in the things of the Lord and um, spur them on and just go, yes, like keep your eyes on Jesus. And I've been doing worship circle now for I think four or five years where I'm a co- one of the coaches and I just mentor um about eight to 10 girls every term and a term is just six months. And Mm. so we do like a, once a month we do a zoom and then we're on a group chat and it's just this connection where we're able to pour into one another. And I get to pour into these girls on a regular basis. And it's literally become my favorite thing. I just love getting to invest in these women who are leading worship, who are serving their families, who are just trying to be obedient to the call of God on their wow, life. So that's something you created? No, I didn't create it. Todd Fields created oh, it. Oh, okay. Sorry. So, no, no. I don't good. know about it. Yeah. So it's, sorry. I don't, um, it's an online mentorship program for worship leaders. And, um, it was started by Todd Fields, who came out of North Point Church in Atlanta. Okay. He and Christy awesome. Knuckles were kind of the front runners. And now there's several of us who are coaches. Rita is a coach. Great. Um, Travis Green, um, Matt Marr just became a coach. Um, Charlie Hall. Um, Great and then people. Todd. Amazing yeah, incredible people. Yeah. people. Kim Walker Smith. Um, and Tasha Cobb, Leonard, and so just a variety so of people. Good. And now we just open it up to the Spanish community. Um, Christine DeClario is one of the coaches, and there's another guy who's coaching, mentoring, like Hispa- specifically Hispanic or Spanish speaking worship leaders. And it's amazing. That's so great. And then we get together yeah. once a year in the mountains of Georgia in January for a I little go. conference called <laughs> You Can Come. You're more than welcome to come. It's open to anybody. Oh, okay, good. But it's the end of January in, yeah. in Georgia. But um, that has definitely been one of the most life giving things Mm. for me, just getting to actually really invest in these girls um, on a regular basis. And Mm. it's been really sweet. That is so awesome. So guys can do it too? Yeah. Nope. It's men and women. All right. Okay. Guys and girls. Very cool. Yeah. Well, let's rewind the clock just a little bit because in preparing for today, I, I hadn't really caught on that you'd been in a movie. Oh, goodness. Uh, Holy Ghost. <laughs> Is that oh, good? okay. Is that the movie? You're oh, yeah. When, were you in another one? I didn't. Yeah. Oh, okay. All right. Mm. Do we want to talk about that or? We can. Well, what's funny is, okay, the movie I thought you were talking about was The Case for Christ. Yes. And the the story about that, my uncle is um, a casting director, 
and was hired to do the, I guess, like the casting, directing, sure, however yeah. you say right, that, right. for the movie The Case for Christ. And he called me one day. I remember where I was. I was at the Whole Foods in Green Hills. <laughs> he was like, hey, so I have a random question. How would you like to be uh, the worship leader for this movie? It's like set in the late 70s, early 80s. Um, it's basically like you would be at, it would be like Willow Creek. You're in the 70s and 80s, right, you know. Right. Um, and we bring a band down and, you know, dress you up like that era. And I'll, I'm like, that sounds like so much fun. So I got a band together and then my husband, Jacob came and played keys and, uh, and we did three songs, um, just, you know, for them to have options of what they wanted mm-hmm. to use. And all of my songs got cut and Jacob's <laughs> is the one that they used. So he's the one that's actually like in the movie. Right. Like you see me for half a second <laughs> and then it goes straight to him and it's like mustache, you know, and like seventies haircut yeah. and stuff. How but fun is that? I know. It's so random, but that's what I thought you were talking about. But you're talking about Holy Ghost. Yeah. 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 I just, I haven't seen it. So yeah. full disclosure here. But yeah. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah. Okay. So, I know it's been a minute. I mean, it's been yes, about it has, six years. It has point, been a few. Has it been six years? Maybe 2014, more, I think. When it 20, released. Yeah, yeah. So we probably filmed it actually in 2013. I think it was actually, I, I, I'd gauge everything um, according to if I was pregnant and who, with whom. <laughs> <laughs> you know? So I don't even think I was pregnant with my daughter yet. And she's my youngest and she just turned six. But um I had a friend that went to my church in Chicago. We went to a church called Harvest Bible Chapel, and he was a documentary maker. And he had made several different documentaries where he basically went around the world and filmed people um, having co- like having conversations with people about certain topics regarding um, a move of God or miracles or healing or um, salvation or whatever it may be. And it was fascinating. I think, I can't even remember all the movies, but there was like Father of Lights, Finger of God, or two of them. I think mm-hmm. there was one more mm-hmm. that I can't remember the name of. And then there was Holy Ghost. And he kind of, if I remember correctly, because I also haven't watched it since probably it released, but it, um, uh, he approached it as, you know, I think sometimes Holy Spirit gets left out in terms of when we think of the Trinity. We talk about the Father quite a bit. We talk about Jesus all the time. But sometimes, especially in non-charismatic circles, the Holy Spirit can kind of take a back seat. And so he's like, but Holy Spirit is the one that is actually living inside of us. He's the one that Jesus promised to us when he said, it is better that I go so that I can send the Spirit of God to fill you, to indwell you. Because Jesus was with us. He walked among us. But the Holy Spirit indwells us as believers. So we basically carry the very presence of God wherever we go. And so my friend Darren, who uh, made these, this film, essentially was just like, I want to know your, your experience with the Holy Spirit. And why he matters to you, why he's important to you when you first encounter the Holy Spirit and knew that he was real. And so it was just a documentary style conversation. Well, the reason I brought it up is because Bill Johnson opens the film with his comments. And you, if I understand it correctly, correct me if I'm wrong, but serving with James McDonald. Yeah. Not really deep into the Holy Ghost kind right, of right. stuff, right? Sure. So yeah. how does uh, I don't know how did that yeah. work out? Well, it's so funny because Darren was at Harvest as well, and he was very much more on the Bill Johnson side of things, right. if you will. <clears throat> I grew up Assembly of God, and then I went to Liberty, which was more of a Baptist school, but still like Kinda. every denomination, yeah, yeah. <laughs> every denomination. Then I landed at Harvest, which was definitely more fundamental but still open to God moving. Um, And so I just, I I guess from my background and even knowing that like, it doesn't even matter what church you're in per se, the Holy Spirit wants to make himself real to us. Mm -hmm. And all we have to do is give him access. All we have to do is go, okay, God, like I want to see you and I want to know you and experience you believing that You know, when the Word of God even talks about, when Jesus talks about worship and how the true worshipers are going to worship in spirit and in truth, they go hand in hand. They inform one another. Um, You can't have one without the other. It's the spirit and the truth together. Sure. So I think as there are some, you know, 
circles of people who have maybe kind of gone all spirit and and very little truth. And there might be some circles of people that have gone all truth and very little spirit. But I believe that God is bringing it back to a place, just awakening the hearts of his bride to go, this is how it's meant to operate. When Jesus said, you will do greater things than even I did. Where is that? Where where are the miracles? That's what I, I mean. They're happening for sure. But I would dare say that most of them are happening not in America because in America we're comfortable especially up in, in, in 2019, <laughs> up till 2020, yeah, right. <laughs> we are comfortable. We were just fine with doing church as usual. But I believe that even in this season, what God has been doing is shaking things up and going, yeah, comfortable Christianity is not going to cut it anymore. Yeah. Like, where's the fire? Where's mm. the urgency? Where Because God is coming back for a pure and spotless bride. And the world is desperate. I mean, the world has essentially gone mad, right? And what they need is the hope of Jesus Christ. They don't need a, a nice little sermon. They need signs and wonders. They right. need to experience right. the living God. God. Have you ever experienced a miracle? Yeah. What? Tell us. <laughs> oh goodness, man. Okay, there, I feel like there's been there's like small miracles, but right. there's large miracles. Mm. I mean, I could tell you a miracle from when I was a kid. Um, it was the first miracle that I can remember, and it might sound silly to grown ups, but for me, it was the way that God was. Uh, he met me. So, my dad had a horse when I was growing up, and we didn't live on a farm. We lived in like a little neighborhood. So he boarded our horse um, out in the country about 20 minutes from us. And uh, one day he came home and he said, I think we're going to breed summertime so she can have a baby. And I'm like, that sounds like a great idea. I want a baby horse, you know? And, uh, but then I guess, I don't even know what happened, but he changed his mind. And I was like, well, I'm going to start praying. And so I started praying for a baby horse. I was like, Jesus, I know that this might sound silly, but I would really love a baby horse. And I prayed every day for a baby horse. One day, uh, the guy that um, kept our our horse summertime called my dad, and he goes, Bill, you are not going to believe this, but I looked out my window this morning, and there was a baby horse laying beside summer. Like, she had literally given birth during the night, and she just had a baby. All by herself. All by herself. Oh, poor summertime. Yes, I know. Well, <laughs> more power to her. And my dad was shocked, and I was like, Jesus answered my prayer. He heard my prayer. He answered my prayer. We went out and saw that horse, and I've had so many, like, even revelations about that since. Like, I've had these, the Lord has kind of reminded me of that, and I've as I've like just sat with him and just gone, okay, Jesus, show me where you were in that. And I see him like right beside me on the fence and he's just looking at me because I'm laughing because I know that he's the one I answered my prayer. I was probably like seven or eight years old. Then my grandma just starts calling, all her friends start calling me. They're telling me, like my, my grandma was like, Meredith, um, the, you know, Miss Betsy has uh, cancer, and well, all these people that had things that they wanted me to pray for. <laughs> you know, they're like, get Meredith to pray for those things. Yeah. The Lord obviously hears her, you know. And you're how old then? I was like seven or eight. Still, okay. This yeah, is, yeah. It was, oh, when okay. I was, it was right after that happened. So they're like calling the me. The gift of faith. I, there you I go. guess so, but yeah. I think it's that childlike faith, you know. And when we just are willing to ask God and believe for the miraculous, like, there's no telling what he's going to do, you know? Mm. And like, I've even tried to instill that in my own kids and I've watched them lay hands on people that were, that were sick and see them healed. And it's just amazing. Like we think that miracles are dead or that was for, you know, the Acts church, but God is the same yesterday, today and forever. Mm. And he's still a God of miracles and he's still a God of the impossible. And I believe one of the things that sets him apart from every other, you know, religion is the fact that he's not dead, he's alive, mm -hmm. and he's actively working and doing miracles, like because he is the God of miracles. He is that, yeah. absolutely. Well, I've experienced a couple of miracles myself. You have healing miracles, and I've um, I went years and years ago. Don't even want to tell you how many years ago I was at uh, Kenneth Hagen's yep. Bible School years yep. ago in in the Holy Land in Tulsa, yeah. Oklahoma. That's awesome. And uh, so I've seen incredible miracles and Amazing. all kinds of healings and, and prayed for people and seen yeah. some notable things. So I'm definitely a believer yeah. in that. But yeah, uh, totally. I think sometimes it's like stirring up those gifts. Yeah. And like you said earlier, just being aware and um, not letting yourself grow cold right. to those things. Yeah. But keeping, 
that yeah. spirit fire. Yep. And I think even just remembering, remembering mm. what God did. And if he did it before, then he can do it again, or he mm-hmm. can do it in greater measure. Mm. Yeah. Now, I know you're not on the road right now, so you're not out all over the world, but what's your sense of what's happening in the global church right now in response yeah. to all of this? Um, I believe that the church is waking up and, um, there's a, there's been a fire ignited, uh, from what I can see. And I have, I have gotten a chance to be out a little bit. Um, I went to Denver in August and then, um, I was, uh, in DC on the mall with 40,000 people in, uh, the end of October. And, um, that was just incredible. Just the people that with so much faith, like mm. the way that they prayed, the way that they worshiped, it was freezing. And we were out there for probably five or six hours. It was raining. It was, you know, and they just kept pressing in. They were so not just hungry, but expectant, expectant for God to move in our nation. And they came and they showed up to pray for our nation, you know, mm. and to worship and declare things over our country. And uh, and then uh, I've had a couple things um, in December as well, just, um, and I'm seeing the same thing. People are just, I think they've realized, you know, the things that we've held on to so tightly that we maybe found security in have been stripped or taken or um, just are not as, <laughs> they just feel like they're f- slipping through our fingers in a lot of ways. And I think that's just, lit a fire in the church to go I want to stand for righteousness I want to see God move I want revival I want and it's going to start in my home first I Mm -hmm. want personal revival um and I just believe that God is stirring and awakening and and we're just at the beginning of it I I believe that what we're going to see in the in the next few years is going to be actual revival repentance a turning um salvations, healings, miracles, God moving in our nation and around the world and demonstrating his glory in a way where people go, that is God, where it's not about a person or a movement. It's about God moving, Mm. you know, Mm. and he gets all the glory. And where does that come from in you? Where does that faith come from in you to see that in the face of everything that's so brutal right now? Yeah, I think when you... One of the verses that God keeps bringing me back to is 2 Corinthians 4. It's like the last three verses, and it says, um, Outwardly we are wasting away, but inwardly we are being renewed day by day. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, uh, but on what is unseen. Because what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. And even when I read the Word of God, and when I read Revelation, or I read in Daniel, or Isaiah, and all the prophets, and talking about what's going to happen in the world, and I can't pretend to know exactly what's going to happen in the world, but I do believe that there are certain things that have to happen before Jesus returns, and I think one of those things is a great awakening, a massive awakening of people, of the church first, and then the world to come back to the Father, to understand His heart for them. Um, I believe it because I believe that it's on the heart of God. I believe that he, he's not willing that any should perish. And he's calling out and he's stirring things up and he's exposing evil and he's, you know, bringing all things into the light. And I think it's, I believe it is because he's wanting to draw people to himself. And how could I not hope for that? How can I not <laughs> expect for that? Um, because that, God's heart is for people. Yeah. It's for salvation. It's that everyone would come to repentance and to know him, to know his love for them, to know his purposes for them. Um, And I think that many times it's persecution, it's pandemics, it's hardships, it's discomfort that shake us awake to see what we really need and what really matters. That's so good. (laughs) <laughs> I mean, I'm not doubting it. I believe too. But. Yeah, for sure. I love that you asked me that, though. It's you good. Know, I mean, we need to be ready to give an account for why we believe what we believe. Yeah. And it's easy to go all pie in the sky about 
things, but you know, sure. it's the bedrock of our faith yep. and uh, being willing to stand in the fire. Yeah. You know, just, exactly. a cu- just a couple more things, if you don't mind. I mean, what place do you feel that worship has in a world on fire? Oh. Huh. And I, and I do mean kind of the style of worship that we're kind of doing these days. Yeah. If I can clarify. For sure. I think worship, um, because, again, if you talk about worship in its purest sense of the word, what does it mean to worship? It's posturing our hearts before the Lord in adoration, in thanksgiving, in praise, in just glorifying Him, magnifying Him. So when we do that, when we elevate the glory of God, the holiness of God, the, the worth of God above our circumstances, our current narrative or scenario, it changes, it changes things. Not, first of all, it changes our perspectives. It, like for me, when I feel down or I've had, I've had a crummy day and I'm like, you know, I want to start over tomorrow. If I will only just take a moment and worship, if I'll just sit down at the piano or turn on Alexa, you know, <laughs> it shifts my perspective in an yeah. instant. And a lot of times I'll play the same song over and over again until I believe it's true, until I believe what I'm singing, until it moves from my head to my heart and I can sing it in faith and I can go, God, I believe that I'm going to see a victory. Even though I don't see it yet, I believe I'm going to see it and I have mm. eyes of faith to see mm-hmm. it. I don't see it in the natural, but I see it coming in the supernatural. And I think when we're just willing to to step out of, again, I know I've used this word a lot, but natural circumstances, the flesh, if we're just like, let's rise above that. Let's see with eyes of the spirit because worshipers will worship in spirit and in truth. It's my spirit communicating with the spirit of God and understanding and receiving revelation from the spirit of God. So it just changes everything. It shifts my perspective. It shifts the atmosphere around me, the people around me. Um, it is a form of warfare. When I stand on a platform and I declare the truths of God over the people of God and back to God, I also believe that it's like arrows of light piercing the darkness. I believe that it is warfare. It is sending confusion to the camp of the enemy, just like when God told the Levites to lead the army. And then he sent confusion to the camp of the enemy. The the warriors didn't even have to lift a sword because the Levites were worshiping and it confused the enemy so much so that they fell on their own swords, right? They could, they, God took care of them. right. And that's what happens when we worship. If there's a battle that we feel like we're in and it's too much, it's overwhelming, it's insurmountable, when we worship, Imagine the angels that go to bat for us or just the fact that God is on our side and the battle is the Lord's and we're just partnering with him in believing that, that he's got this, that he's fighting for us on our behalf constantly, Mm. you know? Um, So you're doing a lot more than just leading music up there. Right. You're doing a lot more than just singing a song. Man, if I was just leading music, I would have quit a long time ago. (laughs) Because it's not, it isn't just music. And anybody can worship, whether you feel like you can sing or not. God, the Bible says make a joyful noise, not a pretty one, you know? So it's just what's coming out of your heart to the Lord. Mm. It's the posture. It's the response. It's going, God, I've seen you move before, and I believe you'll do it again. And I'm going to ascribe to you worth and power and might and majesty because you're worthy of it. And that's mm. what you carry, and that's who you are. And... uh yeah, I just to to worship in a world on fire is everything. And I believe that worship will only grow. The sound will only grow. The sound will only um escalate. Uh the sound of worship, I mean, the sound of heaven and the earth will only rise as things become more on fire. <laughs> yeah, right. Crazy. Because that just gives this opportunity for the church to go, this is our hour. This is our hour to stand in faith. The things that we've been saying for all these years, this is where the rubber meets the road. This is where it really counts. Am I going to stand firm in my faith? And am I going to sing? Am I going to worship? Am I going to declare freedom and joy and hope where it feels like that has been lost? 
Am I going to declare unity and faith where it feels like that has been lost? Because I believe that that is what God is stirring in his church right now. You know, so I'm getting fired up. I'm John. getting fired up too. <laughs> We're going to take up an offering here in a minute. But <laughs> What's the one thing that you wish the world knew about you that they probably don't? Hmm. I don't know if it's something that they probably don't. Um, I want to please the Lord more than anything else, more than any, more than any record sales or, uh, you know, streams or spins or whatever you call it. Um, more than any followers, I just want to please the heart of God, and everything that I do, I don't always get it right. Um, and I think, you know, people who are in ministry or people who have a platform uh, are held to a higher standard sometimes, and, and rightly so, but also we're still human. Um, and I don't always get it right, but my desire and my chief motivation is to please the heart of God and to point people to Him. Because I know that I I can't change anybody and I can't, you know, I, I, I'm nothing without the Lord. Like, again, just goes back to everything I have, He's given me. Um, but in that, you know, in that filter of being motivated by just honoring God and simply letting that be it, it means that I may say things that ruffle feathers. It means that I may say things or uh, present things in a way that, uh, you know, isn't necessarily politically correct. Um, but I also believe in this hour that the church is meant not to like cower and hide, but to stand firm, to be full of truth and love, to, uh, I think of, there's a verse, I think it's in Hosea. I could be wrong. It's in one of the Old Testament prophets, but it says, let justice roll like a river and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. And I believe that that stream and that river is coming out of us, justice and righteousness. And it's not, I'm not even talking about social justice. I'm not talking about anything but the justice of the Lord. What is just in his eyes? And also understanding that he is merciful. So how do I show justice and mercy? How do I walk humbly with God, but also be very um, true to what God has put in my heart? Um, just a side note, um, as I've been like leaning in and listening to the Lord specifically in the last few months, uh, I've been asking God, what do you call me? What's your identity? What was my identity from you? Um, your, your name for me. And uh, I wasn't getting anything for a, the longest time. And I was frustrated because Jacob got something like right off the bat. And I was like, that's not fair. Warrior. <laughs> you know? Yeah, bro. His is... Um, <laughs> Keyboard guy. Str- right. <laughs> Can you His is strong heart and brilliant light. Oh, that's cool. And he's just kind of unpacked it and continued to ask the Lord, what does that mean? What does that look like for, you know, how do you see me in that context? And one day, um, the Lord just kind of unexpectedly said, I call you Braveheart. And I immediately got this picture of the little uh, Care Bear cousin. I grew up watching Care Bears. And there's a Care Bear cousin because there were the Care Bears. They were all bears and there were the cousins. They were all different animals. But I, if I remember correctly, Braveheart was the little lion. Mm. And it had a heart with a crown on, on it. And I just got this picture of me. I'm like, that's me. I'm the lion. Aww. Like, cause I, <clears throat> um, I, I think in the last year, the Lord has just made it very clear. Like I've given you courage and bravery, not for the sake of, of those things, but for the sake of saying what's on my heart, even when it's not popular. And I'm uh, making people aware maybe of even things that are going on in the world that I wasn't even necessarily aware of before a year ago. And God has just opened my eyes. And I, and I think it comes back to 
talking about um, God sifting and shaking and unearthing things, that he's bringing things into the light. Mm. And I think people are gradually just beginning to awaken to the evil that's in the world. But more than that, the way that God wants to bring his justice and his righteousness and establish it in the earth, how he wants to uh, rule in mercy and justice, in love and kindness and holiness, and kind of going, uh, we've lost, I was listening even to a message out at a conference that I was at last weekend, um, and the preacher was talking about how, you know, we had this era maybe in like the 80s and 90s of where the holiness was always preached, but almost to a fault where it became legalistic. And then we swung the pendulum the opposite way, and it's all been grace, grace, grace. He's like, but you have to understand it's both and. It's this operating in the, on the narrow road. It's holiness and it's grace. It's grace to walk in holiness, right? And uh, he's like, but we've forgotten that. And we've forgotten the fear of the Lord. So how do we get back to that? Walking in holiness and understanding that the word of God and the things that he lays out for us in scripture aren't like to kill our party, <laughs> but it's actually for our protection. It's for our good. It's mm-hmm. for his glory and his ways are higher and better. And we don't always get that. And we don't always understand that. I don't always understand that. I'm like, Lord, but I want it this way. He's like, but just wait and see what I'm going to do with this. Right? So I've been rambling a lot, John, and thank you for listening. But oh my I, goodness, it's good. I it's hope like so. I'm already looking forward to uh, podcast number three. Let's do it. You, you, you <laughs> yes. have some beautiful, awesome things to say, Meredith. Thank you so much. For and sure. Yeah, we could keep going, but yeah, maybe we'll save it for number three. Let's huh? do it. Yeah. Okay. Sounds Meredith, good. thanks so much for being with us. Thanks for having me. Thanks for listening to the Song Revolution podcast designed to help you live a more inspired and meaningful life. Subscribe now and share this podcast with the creatives in your circle. You can connect with John Chisholm on Facebook or visit NashvilleChristianSongwriters.com to take your songwriting to the next level.